All right, welcome to the February 5th, 2024 and on credits working group meeting. Status update on where we are with uh, W3C format update and issues going along with that. I saw a PR from Timo this morning that we can um, touch on. Um, then I want to query Mike on Alisor revocation, particularly perhaps verifiable encryption and other uh, ZKP capabilities. Um, Alisor is the main one I'm, I'm really interested in talking about today. I think we're actually, based on the work being done, I'm actually very close to wanting to um, put together a um, first cut of the Enonpreds V2 specification. So that becomes a possibility out of this. Um, let's see, a reminder, this is a Linux Foundation, Hyperledger Foundation meeting. So the uh, Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect, as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Please be good to one another. Um, meeting uh, agendas, it's actually not listed on the page, but uh, I should put that in. Um, but uh, if you want to add your name to the attendees list, um, any other topics to go over today on this call? Uh, Stephen, at the bottom of the open discussion uh, section, I left links to two workshops that are coming out of Hyperledger in the next uh, few months. This Thursday, we've got um, Decentralized Identity and Interoperability, Connecting Credo yes. with Hyperledger, Bezu, Cardano, Checked, Hyperledger and Oncreds, and uh, OpenID Connect for VCs. Um, and then uh, April 24th, there's a Zero Knowledge Proofs um Zero knowledge, zero knowledge proofs and ZK programming and blockchain application development. And you have to actually save the wiki page for you to be able to see it. So now it's- Yeah, it's I know. Discussion. Sorry about that. If you hit save, I'll hit save and I can see it. Do it. You got it. All right. There you go. And those are the links to the registration. Sorry, everybody. There they are. Um, who's doing this one, um, Sean? The ZKP one? Uh, that would be um, Daniel's. I'm going to- Daniel Zigo and hang on. Um Andras Zabolsi. Uh so okay. Daniel has been a community uh, contributor for a while. Um he and Andras have uh, put this together and it's happening in late April. Okay. Sounds good. We need to get some on the on the list. So um I'll be thinking about that. Got some other discussions going on on that. Um over to um, folks working on the W3C format status updates. Um, any updates you want to report, let us know, or any topics you want to go over? Um, I was thinking um, maybe Martin can do a short demo um, oh, uh, awesome. of the implementation in AFJ. Yes. So it can I share my screen? Yes, you may. I think it should just work. I hope. Let me know if not. Uh, I also need to update my preferences. That's probably uh, if you're on a map, you'll probably have to leave and come back. So that'll be okay. okay. We'll we'll wait so, for you. I'll come back. <laughs> yeah. See you in a moment. This is what we're uh, trying to do with SSI also, right? Giving user control over. Uh... How, how, how your data is used. <laughs> well played. Welcome back. Thanks. So let's try again. Excellent. Uh, can you see my screen? Mm-hmm. Nice. Yes. So uh, in AFJ or in Credo now, we are mostly finished with the changes. There are a few small to-dos now, um, but uh, the biggest parts are finished. Um, the, we can now issue credentials with the new data integrity format and also request proofs via the uh, presentation exchange and convey the credentials in the W3C uh, format, right? Um, I have a branch on my uh, GitHub where I have created a demo, so where we have two agents, uh, Feather and Dallas, kind of like the 
uh, old demo if anyone knows it, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, how we can issue a credential for a credential from an agent called Feather to Alice, and uh, then uh, send a proof request from Feather to Alice and get a response. Uh, so we could also use that for interrupt testing because you asked last time. Um, uh, yeah, I can also quickly show you in code how that looks. Uh, can you see VS Code? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just very simple. Um, Faber, so the which is the issuance side, uh, imports a few static bits. I uh, use checked now. Uh, because it was simpler to do to implement. Uh, so we imported it and uh, we register schema, credential definition, uh, create a connection with Alice or with another agent. It's uh, not important that it's the same or that it's credo. Um, and this is how we can offer a credential in, um, in credo now. So we just uh, specify the connection ID if we say that we want to use the new data integrity format. Mm -hmm. Binding required. Uh, we now want binding using the Adam Credits link secret binding method. And uh, we also pass in the uh, the credential or the W3C credential here. It's not a verifiable credential yet, just the W3C credential. Right. Um, yeah, the claims must align with the, uh, which what uh, is contained in the schema, obviously, but uh, that's it. Uh, then for Faber, we just uh, wait until we receive our request and then accept it. And let's just continue for the uh, Faber side here. This is how we request a proof. Uh, also very simple, we just uh, say this is the agent that proves that request proof. And we say we want to do it using a diff presentation exchange. And all we need to do is uh, provide the pres a presentation definition. This uh, should be exactly the presentation definition which we used uh, in the test vectors repo. So um, should be, uh, I think that's pretty nice. Uh, we uh, want the data integrity protected VC in return uh, with an Adam Kretz 2023 signature. Uh, I could remove this, but it hasn't hurt either. And um, yeah, then the, the uh, Faber just accepts the presentation. Now, uh, let's just see also or quickly look at the other side where we, um, if we receive a, or Alice receives a credential offer, we just say that uh, we want to accept, we provide the, the link secret ID with which we want or to which we want to uh, bind the credential to. And when we receive the credential, we just accept and process it. Um, for the proof request, essentially for Alice, exactly, exactly the same. Uh, yeah, we select the credentials for the request automatically, then um, uh, we just accept the proof request once we receive it. Uh, yeah, I can also quickly run it here. So, Let's see, can you read this or is it too small? In the terminal? Yeah, perfect. I'm good. Uh, so uh, for Faber, for example, here we can just create a connection invitation. Uh, Alice receives the connection invitation, and then we can offer a credential here from Faber to Alice, which with a did check for now. Nice. Which uh, registers the schema credential definition. Uh, that always takes a little bit. Yeah, nice. So the credential offer is sent. We also see that here, uh, credential offer received. We want to accept it now. Uh, yeah, again, the offer is accepted and that's it. So, so uh, yeah, the messages are not so nice. Sorry for that, but it received the credentials. It's yeah. processed, but um, it's, we can also request a proof. Um, the same there. The proof request is received here when we want to accept it. Uh, yeah, and here at the Faber side, we see that the presentation was was accepted. Nice. I can also quickly show this is how the presentation uh, submission and, and the presentation itself looks like. So 
for the submission, we just have, wait, let me make this a bit, a bit bigger. We just have a random ID here, then the presentation definition ID, uh, the descriptor match, the descriptor ID for the H verification, which we called it, um, which uh, says that we have a data integrity verified representations at this path here in the presentation, uh, verified with credential zero. Um, yeah. So here, if you look at the presentation, which Faber or the Faber received there, then we can see that there is one credential. And so essentially it's pointing to this here. And it is, and you can see that it's like this, it has yeah. the crypto suites out of yeah. 23, um, data integrity protect. Excellent. So that was all from my side, unless there are some questions. I love that line. That's all from my side. <laughs> That's a whole lot, Martin. That is awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. All right. Any questions for anyone? Yeah. Indeed. Very cool. Okay. Um, the folks from the Akapai team are meeting after, and I'll make sure they're aware of this. I'll I might even extract out the video of this and and have it as a separate um, uh, separate part, so we can just demo that and it can be shared um, more broadly. Just that one section. So excellent work, fantastic. Okay. That is that side of it. Any other questions, comments on that? And then we'll move on to uh, Mike cool. talking to you about revocation. You ready? For me to talk about it? Yeah. Yes. So I've got questions. So I'm going to do a question and answer on this. Anyone can jump in at any time but I'm hoping to sort of facilitate a conversation and um, understand it. So Alice Orr, for those not aware, is a um, very high, um, a um, scalable revocation scheme in zero knowledge. Um, so has the same attributes as the um, and non -cred, existing and non-credits revocation in that a, um, an issuer can issue a revocable credential. A holder um, would receive the credential and when asked for a presentation would be able to prove without sharing a linkable identifier that their credential is not revoked such that the verifier would believe that. Um, in this, the in, in the current work, the way it the way it's done is the issuer publishes a the state of the revocation registry, which is um, a combination of an accumulator value and then the status of all of the credentials as being either revoked or not revoked onto a ledger or into some public place such that the issuer or the holder can retrieve that, do a calculation based on the state present that to the verifier and the verifier needs the accumulator to be able to verify the um the presentation the the non-revoked presentation proof um Alisor changes that in that um rather than publishing uh the 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 issuer might publish a the accumulator um, but other than that, uses a what's called a revocation manager, and and I'm going to get corrections and so on of this. But let me just give my um, quick overview. Um, a, a revocation manager that works in um, based on knowledge and information from the issuer um, is able to receive a request from a holder to update information they hold, such that they can produce the proof that corresponds with an accumulator. They, uh, the holder constructs the proof, sends it to the verifier, the verifier retrieves the accumulator and verifies the proof. The revocation manager can be a single instance 
of a revocation manager. In other words, that all holders contact a revocation manager or more interestingly, um, there can be multiple revocation managers and the holder can shard their key, split their key, their the information they provide to the revocation manager, send it to a bunch of different ones, collect the results, and then assemble the information necessary to create their proof. So that's the overall scheme. So a, a similar scheme and, and similar interactions, and from what I understand, but we'll find out more, similar data to um, what's done with um, the existing revocation scheme, but in a much more scalable way in that um, there's no tails file to be shared or anything like that. The revocation manager holds a bunch of information and is able to do what it needs to do in interacting with the holder um, so that the only data that's actually passed back and forth between the participants, between the, the issuer and the holder, the revocation manager and the holder, the uh, holder and the verifier are quite small pieces of data, um, you know, on the order of kilobytes. And um, there's no need to pass big, massive files around, um, at least amongst other than the issuer and revocation manager. Um, but that's what I want to explore as part of this is what is the data that is passed around? Not necessarily from a precise cryptographic definition, but more um, um, attributes of that data, like is it a, an identi a, a linkable identifier? How does it relate? How do the pieces of data relate to one another? And that's what I want to ask Mike about. So that's the goal of this session. So we start with um, what do the issuer and what's the relationship between the issuer and revocation manager and what data do they share or how does the issuer um, keep the revocation man manager up to date? Okay, so let's define what all the data bits are, and that'll help with answering that question. Okay. So the bits and pieces of Allosaur are, you've got the accumulator that is basically a fixed size digest that represents the entire set. So I don't know what you want to call that. Yeah, that, um, that's fine. Uh, so um, that's and, probably... And, and... Sorry, I I might say fine. I'm I'm having feel like I'm having more conversation with Mike and documenting. But anyone jump in at any time and you know raise your hand or just come off mute and ask questions. So an accumulator just is a a a single value that takes into account all of the um, Members. data from all of the uh, credentials that have been issued. Correct. Yes. That is public, right? That has to be public. Otherwise, yeah. no one could make a proof. Yeah. But the cool thing is, it doesn't matter how big the size of the set is, this value never changes in size. It's like, you know, if you had SHA-256, it doesn't matter what, what the pre-image was, whether it's a gigabyte image or if it was just like your zip code, the five digits, the output is the same size. So okay. then there are the... I'm trying to elements of the set. Okay. Yeah. Now, this is where I'm trying to not blur the line between the cryptographic value that's added into the accumulator and something else. So, okay. in reality, you could make these whatever you want. So, if you look in the non creds v2 Rust code, I just made these UUIDs that get hashed. So, it's no different than a hashed, uh, schema element or claim element but you don't even have to do that you could just say it's just a random 32 byte value okay if you want and and this me, is shared and no. this is what the um holder gets so they know which credential is theirs yes so here's the thing the issuer needs to track every one of these right this is like equivalent to what goes in the tails file kind of thing, yeah. right? Yeah. But only the issuer needs to know this. And whenever a credential is signed, obviously only one of those values is given to the holder. That in a non v2 Rust is what I call um, just their, their revocation claim. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So this this is what um um this is what gets gets revoked. Essentially, yes, that 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 is when you revoke that is removed from the accumulator. So technically the the zero knowledge proof is a membership proof that your value yeah. is in it. Yeah, got um, it. So that's different from the way we've we have it today which is that um the holder gets the index of their of of their credential 1 through 1000 or 1 through 10000 and and today um the index points to the item, the element similar to this thing in the tails file. In this case, they actually get the element and the and the issuer is tracking the um, whether that element is included or not in the accumulator. Correct. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. The third value. And again, we haven't defined what the terminology should be. Yeah. is well at least in non-creds one we call it the witness yeah um i'm trying to for v2 i tried calling it the revocation handle you could also think of it as a revocation signature um but either way this is another piece that is known only to the holder but it's created by the issuer And hand it over. Okay. Now, without knowing the element of the set and this witness, the holder cannot create a valid zero knowledge proof. They have to have both to create the private, you know, the private proof that says I am part of the set. Okay. So hang on one sec. Oh, you're fine. Needed with the element. Yep. To produce the holders MRP non revocation proof. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay. So those are the three bits of data that are associated with Allosaur. Okay. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. One more. The fourth piece is the signing or the secret key associated with managing the accumulator, and then obviously a public key, an associated public key. Okay. These are known only, well, at least the private key is known only by the accumulator manager or issuer if they're one and the same. The public key is also published with the accumulator, but obviously it's probably never going to change. So, but in order for anyone to verify an NRP, they have to have that public key and the accumulator. They have to have knowledge of that. Those are the two public pieces that have to be known by anyone who wants to verify. Okay, so now that and, we have one more thing, mm -hmm. um, must have the whoops and the public key. Sorry, um, just to confirm, when a holder makes a creates an NRP, they use a particular accumulator, so the verifier must know the same accumulator. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 So now, well, then that, that's where I'm going next is now that you know what the four uh, pieces of data are, there's the keys, the accumulator, the witness, and the elements. Okay. Now, who knows what? Now, we've kind of covered that, right? Obviously, the keys and Well, now we've element. got this. Okay, so now we talk about this revocation manager. Um, yeah, you want to separate. Because that's a new, that's a new concept to those of us in the non-creds world. So talk a bit about the issuer revocation manager relationship. Um, they could be one and the same. Yeah. Right. Uh, but they don't have to be. So if you had like a third party, um, well, and here's probably why we separated out. Allosaur allows thresholdizing the secret key to do the updates. So that was one of the main innovations of the paper is to be able to manage the accumulator in an MPC threshold way. So if the accumulator manager is different than the issuer, then that means the private key 
or a secret key could possibly be split among a distributed network like a DLT, right? Or a blockchain or however you want to do it. And then when the issuer says, I need you to revoke this, they would have to obviously maybe go through some access control policies to make sure they could do that. And then the revocation manager would publish the updates once that, if they determined the issuer was authorized to do that. But if they're one and the same, then in either case, the only time the accumulator has to change is when elements are removed. So before, with most accumulators, anytime you added or removed values, you had to update the accumulator. With Alistair, right. you have to update on removals. So you cut down on half of the work, which is great. So that's the relationship between the issuer and the accumulator manager. The issuer no. just basically says, I need you to remove the following values and proves that they are authorized to do so. Then the revocation manager removes those values from the accumulator and then returns the new updated value, the new accumulator digest, whatever you want to call it. That's it. Hold on. Um, of elements that are removed and the new accumulator. Is that right? Or do they just calculate their own new accumulator? Well, the revocation manager would calculate the new accumulator value. Okay. If they're separate. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever holds the revocation keys has to do the update. So if the issuer does not have those, the rev the revocation manager does. If they're and one this in the requires, same. Um, requires some part of the private key to be able to do this. Yes, you have to have the private key to do any re re removals. Okay. And now, do the revocation managers keep hold of all the elements, or do they just hold on to the accumulator after they process them? Sorry, say that again. Um, do the do the revocation managers have to have to remember all the elements that are removed, or do they? Someone does. Okay. So well, obviously usually the that's issuer the issuer does. does. Well, no, the issuer would. Okay, so the, yes, yeah. they do. Yeah, the issuer yeah. does. Yeah. Now, when they want to create a new credential, for example, the issuer. Uh, well, hold on. Let's go to issuer setup. So what is what has to happen? So we know the re relationship between these two now and what well, they're yeah. going to do. So let's go yeah. to issuer setup. Well, so hang on. There's one more thing. Okay. When the issuer wants to create a new credential, they have to talk to the revocation manager and say, I need a witness for this element, right? Because whoever has the key can create witnesses. This is usually why it, I mean, if the revocation manager was like, obviously um, malicious, he could just create it for whoever, whatever, but assume he's honest, you know, the issuer is storing the elements and the revocation manager doesn't have to remember those. Okay. But the issuer says, I need you to create a witness for this element and give it back to me. So then the revocation manager, obviously, if he's authorized, is the issuer says, yep, okay, here you go. And gives him a witness, which is then forwarded to the holder. Okay. Okay. So now for issuer setup in terms of revocation... Um, they just have to decide what the elements look like. Do they want to do what I was doing, which is just right. generate a UUID that gets hashed, or maybe it's some random string gets hashed. It doesn't matter. Or are they just going to take a raw value and use that? It doesn't really matter. That's really the only setup that they have. They have to determine where the accumulator gets published along with the verifying key. So maybe the revocation manager has no say in where those go. The issuer does. Okay. Obviously, if they're one and the same, it doesn't matter. But the accumulator value has to go somewhere. Maybe the issuer just holds on to it in the public key.
but anybody who wants to verify has to have access to those values. Otherwise, they can't verify anything. Similar to you know the credential public key, you got to have that too. Yeah. And presumably they have to initialize the, they have to tell the revocation manager, hey, we've got a new revocation registry, right? Uh, yeah, that's what, yes. So then the issuer says, hey, uh, revocation manager, I need a new registry. And at that point, the, um, the revocation manager will create new keys. They'll create new keys and a new rev and a new accumulator value and return that to the issuer. Okay. Now the interesting thing here is every time we talk about we contact the issuer or the holder contacts the revocation manager, it could be done as in a sharded way so that you're so that yep. you're doing this in a multi in MPC, is that right? Correct. Yes. So even yep. on issue or oh, well, setup, when you issue, when you say I want a new revocation, would would the issuer create the key and then send it, shard it to each of the revocation managers? Um, I think you're maybe mixing concepts here. Okay. So. Who, who controls the that private key? I thought the issuer did, but you're saying the actually the revocation managers do? Yes. Yes. Okay. Whoever is so, making the updates to the accumulator hold, has to hold the, the keys. So if you're doing it in the threshold setting, then okay. it's the revocation manager. If it's the issuer, then obviously that's where the key should live. Okay. I... And, and they can do that without coordinating with one another? They can do a partial key without coordinating with one another? The um, revocation manager? No, they'll usually use like a distributed key generation algorithm okay. to do that. That uh, way, no one, no one entity or computer holds the whole thing. So obviously, there's like a bunch of these MPC networks that do DKGs where some of the holders have it's like partial custody right where your phone holds some of the keys they hold the rest of the, the shares or there's lit who you know it's distributed among a whole network or the issuer and the revocation manager could do it that way yeah, either in either case you could do it in a distributed you know key ceremony yeah. so that the key is split among multiple parties and none of them ever had the whole thing at one time yeah so, and who and who, the issuer would publish the public key yeah so in, in my mind if you want to have like the, the best architecture you can you basically say the revocation manager his sole purpose is to manage the keys and witness updates that's all he does yep okay so obviously he has to remember the the latest accumulator value the public key the obviously the key sh the private key shares are split among multiple parties and um that's it just those three things that, and that's all he does okay. and then the issuer is the one who's remembering all the elements where where the accumulator and public verifying key are, are published who's revoked who's added you know etc he's basically yeah. in my mind the the issuer should be responsible for all the decision making and business logic Whereas the revocation manager is just all the cryptography for the most okay. part. Okay. But like I said, they could be one and the same if that's the easiest. They don't yeah. have to be separated, but this, it allows this obviously to happen. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to issue a credential. Okay. So the issuer um, picks an element could be generated on the fly or maybe he has a preset list, doesn't matter. And yeah. then the issuer says to the revocation manager, I need a new witness for this value, for this element. So then the 
Revocation Manager creates a new witness. Like I said, it's similar to like generating a signature. Sends it back to the issuer. And then the issuer can then forward that piece of information along with the signed credential to the holder. Credential, element, and witness. Yep. Um, does, uh, I'm they wondering about- them the, um, They may want to give them the accumulator value as well, just so okay. that the holder knows this is what it was, like the version of the accumulator that I can prove against. Um, okay, quick question on that. Um, what about a timestamp to know when it was created? Sure. It's is not that required necessary? For the program. It no. seems to me that would be necessary, not just sure. <laughs> well, why would it be necessary? Um, it Because that associates the witness and the accumulator together. So that if the verifier has to independently go get the accumulator for the given witness, it knows which version of the accumulator to get because the, the accumulator will change over time. Well, that's why I was saying you give the current, you give the accumulator value also to the holder so they know what version they had. If, adding a timestamp in my mind is just optional if, if it makes it easy to say this is when it was done. What you about know, version though? No. Sorry version i mean oh well the accumulator every time it changes is like a digest right it just changes so yeah that's what i'm saying you give that to the holder and they say this is the version i have so version of the accumulator is needed well it's it's like a digest right so anytime it's i'm sorry modified, and i don't understand the term digest so what does oh. digest mean uh think of like a hash like that's what i thought just yeah. all I think of it is a hash, but I don't know whether this you is the... Well, the thing is, you don't need to hash the accumulator because it basically is a hash. <laughs> it already is. If any, if anything is removed at all, if it ever changes, it basically yeah. is a new hash. So that is your version. Okay, but... I, you want to add a time a, step to it? That's fine too. doesn't matter. But just uh, this is what I'm trying to understand. If as a holder, I'm going to send a proof, the element, and a witness to a verifier, and the verifier is going to independently go get the accumulator that's associated that that is the correct accumulator of all the accumulators that have been created. It's going to use the right one. How is it going to know which is the right accumulator to ask for? Um, okay, so now now we're talking holder to verifier. Well, we can wait, but eventually we're going to get to that. So, but let's, if if you think we can leave it for now, that this is the, the only data that goes to the holder are these three things. Four things, I mean. <laughs> okay, so the holder is going to have, yeah, the signed credential, the element, the witness, and the accumulator. Okay. Correct. Yep. All right. So issuer has now decided I'm going to revoke a credential. Mm -hmm. What does it share? What does it send to the revocation manager? Um, besides the authorization that, you know, it's allowed to do this just yeah. Single element or elements. Let's say it's revoking, like say yeah. ten thousand at a time. Just says re remove all these, and the revocation manager will obviously check: Are you authorized? Okay, you are. I'll and then I'll return to you the new accumulator value. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so now the holder wants to create a presentation. So the holders. Been, okay. Yeah, holders so, got. 
Yeah. So the holder doesn't have to do anything just yet. So the verifier is basically going to say, I need to know that your credential is fresh enough, right? Ah, okay. So, so he might look wherever the issuer has published the values of the accumulator. Maybe it's only the latest. Maybe he has every version for the last 30 days, you know, depending on whatever your risk uh, okay. tolerance is, right? Yeah. For how fresh you want these. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah. Then the verifier is going to go, okay, I've got like, maybe I'm going to grab the most recent five or maybe just the recent one because I know the issuer only updates once every 24 hours and that's good enough for me. So he just grabs wherever that is and the public verifying key um, and says, I need you to prove that you're not revoked as of this accumulator value. Uh, that's part of the uh, presentation okay. request, right? Yep. And sends yep. that to the holder. Obviously, that's what no I was other. missing. Got it. Yeah. So okay. the verifier can basically pick how fresh they want it to be. Yeah. Right. It could be as of a week ago, 24 hours ago, seven minutes ago, whatever. You know, it just depends on how often the issuer up, you know, wants to, to make changes. So okay. Now that the holder has what accumulator version the verifier wants him to prove against. Yeah. Yeah. He looks at it and goes, is it the same version for which I have one? If it is, great. I don't have to do anything. I can just generate a proof, which only needs my witness and my element and obviously my verifiable credential. Those are the only three things he needs. And then he can generate the NRP and, send and present. Yeah. If it is not the latest version, or he doesn't have one for that version, then the holder needs to contact either the issuer or the somehow the data has to get to the revocation manager, however yeah. that needs to happen. Yeah. Now, could he have the verifier do it? Yes, we could. Yeah. Could we have yeah. the issuer do it? Yes, we could. Or okay. maybe you can just go directly to the revocation manager. This part is completely up to you, whichever is easiest. But what the holder is going to do is he's going to call the up Alisor update protocol. It says, I need a new witness. Here was the old accumulator value that I have. Or no, he doesn't even need that. He just says, I need to update to the latest version. So he basically says, I need to go to this version, whatever that version is. Maybe it's not the latest. Maybe it's two of them ago, but he says, I need to get my witness to that one. Sends what? What do they send? Ah, so this is the this is the part. So if they want to maintain privacy so that yeah. no one knows who is updating, then they um, will just do a Shamir secret sharing split of their element. Yeah. And send enough of those pieces to the revocation manager. The revocation manager goes, okay, these obviously came from someone who had one, but I can't tell what they are. That's part of the protocol. Yeah, yeah. And I will then, for each share uh, that I receive, I will perform an operation and send it back. So in the distributed network, let's just say for simplicity, the holder is talking directly to the revocation manager. And the revocation manager maybe has five nodes where the key is split among them. Yeah. Right? yeah. The holder can do whatever they want. They can split into as many pieces as they want. Yeah. Um, and send, they have to send at least a threshold of those to the revocation manager. Now yeah. here's the, here's the cool part. This can be as creative as you want. So let's say there's five nodes from the revocation manager and me as a holder, I do, I'm going to say, I'm going to split my, element into 10 of 20 and i'm going to send four shares to this party three to this one five to this one two to this one it doesn't matter where they send it the revocation manager doesn't know if it's the same person or a different person or even for the same element under the hood so 
Anyway, Got it. once enough of those have been processed, they're just immediately sent back. The revocation, those five nodes don't even have to talk to each other to yeah. do this update. They just go, okay, I'll process your share or shares with my piece of the secret key, send you back a value. And then once the holder has enough uh, returned responses from the revocation manager, he applies some simple math arithmetic with his witness, and now he has brought current to that. So now he can prove against that accumulator value. Yeah. Notice the witness never leaves the holder. Yeah. And two, let's say someone was sniffing and watching all of this. Mm -hmm. Then um, they let, let's just say they just listened and got all the responses back from the from the um, revocation manager. Yeah. It doesn't matter because the information they get back, since they've never had a valid witness at all, it does nothing for them. Yeah. Yeah. So from that side of things, it's secure. So even if you have a passive adversary that's snooping and watching updates, as long as he never gets the witness value itself, which you'll notice never leaves the holder, he can't do anything with the data that comes back. It's just useless. Okay. So let's go to the other scenario where, so otherwise the holder sends a witness they have No, they never send their witness anywhere. <laughs> okay, so how else, other than splitting it, can they no, get No, they don't it? split the witness, they split the element. No, I know that. Oh, Is there okay. any other way to get an update? Um. Well, the other way you could get an update is if you wanted to do the deltas for yeah. the changes yeah. between yeah. each accumulator. You could do it that way, but it's... Um, involves a lot more risk because if there's enough elements published, like let's say you put it, you have a million elements in there <laughs> and you get enough deltas that are published, then an attacker could extract the private key. Hold on. The private hold key. on. So there's not a way that the holder, I thought, I thought there was a way that the holder could send their witness and accumulator and the accumulator associated with that witness and get an update. Um, you never send the witness anywhere. He could, he could send his, just his element and the accumulator and say, give me a witness for this and give it up to date. But then he's also leaking who he is. So yeah, yeah, you can exactly. still do that. Yeah, you can still do that. That's still possible. If he doesn't care, if we don't care about anonymity, he just says, here's my element. Here's the accumulator value it was for. Well, he doesn't even have to do that. He can just say, give me the latest, give me a latest witness for this uh, element, and then it'll come back. And he'll get the witness directly as if it was done during issuance. So okay. it's pretty much the same thing if you don't want to do the distributed update and hide who's who's updating. And in that sense, it's just a call home from the holder to the issuer or revocation yeah. manager. I mean, both are essentially a call home, but one reveals who it is. The other one doesn't. So, so a way to do it this way via the verifier is even if you have a single revocation manager, I could send a split element Is the is the with Shamir's secret is every time you split the element getting the same result or can you do it that you get a different one every time? Well, no, yeah. When you split it, you, it's randomized, so you get different ones every time. Every time you split it, you get randomized ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the way to do this would be even with with a single verify or a single revocation manager, even if you did it with a single revocation manager, if you sent them five shares, they wouldn't be able to tell who you were. Nope. They don't know which element it's for. They don't know which accumulator. It, well, they have to know which accumulator it's for, but yeah. otherwise, yeah. 
that's all they would know is I got I got a random I got some random data I'm supposed to process to update it for this accumulator okay obviously you should do some uh, authorization checks of course but even if it was a malicious attacker that somehow got knowledge of the element as long as he doesn't have the witness his result will not mean anything yeah yeah so regardless of whether you actually whether you have multiple revocation managers because you can send the shares to a single multiple shares to a single revocation manager they just do four calculations or whatever and send you back four results and you're good yep yeah so if you and, did four of seven right you yeah send four you could send five and say i'm just going to ignore the first two as yeah. a distraction and then get the rest you know doesn't and matter then just to be clear that every time you split your element with using a Shamir secret algorithm, you're going to get a different set of values. That's correct. Okay. So even if you are using a single, a single service for doing this, they're still not going to be able to get a correlatable identifier. That's right. Okay. Okay. That's cool. Okay. That that's the, the magic that I was missing in doing this okay so holder to verifier there's a an nrp and a nrp and um that is generated using the elements and witness mm -hmm. Um, and then the verifier and the revocation manager, the verifier has already re retrieved the accumulator. Okay. And then it's possible that the, um, the verifier could also send the accumulator along. Sure. Well, he's going to have to acknowledge of it either way. Because right now you did it this way, which is, okay, here's the accumulator. But it could be done the other way where the verifier just re just um, confirms that there is a, a an accumulator with the value given by the holder. Yeah, you could do that too. Yeah. Yeah, like the, the holder might say, here's the version I know of. Is that fresh enough for you? And the verifier, yeah. depending on their risk tolerance, will say yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That was awesome. Um, we're just about out of time, but that that was hugely helpful for me. Hopefully it was interesting to others and, and of value, but that explains the Allosaur revocation scheme, um, which is pretty important in what we're doing. Um, a pretty important um, element of it, if you will, since we're overusing the word element. If you want to, I, I hate saying member. <laughs> yeah. So we can come up with other. No, oh, yeah, for no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. That works. Um, I now totally get the data flow and how it can be done and the importance of Shamir Seeger. Because one of the things that I've been thinking about is, wow, it's really hard to organize a bunch of revocation managers that don't know about each other. But it's the use of Shamir Secret is um, to enable, even if you're sending it to a single party, to split the element so that the element is never known. And that's that's the crucial part. That's the non-linkability, unlinkability. Yeah, that's the unlinkability when they call home. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So even if they call home, it's unlinkable. That's awesome. Yep. Unlinkability on call home, unlinkability during presentation. So yep. there's no way to link them, at least through revocation mechanisms. Yeah. So. Now, one other thing um, to mention to folks, um, one of the concerns here is if you do call home, um, with it, the holders doing it, one of the things we've talked about, and it came out about sort of accidentally, but is is a completely valid thing, which is the holder could send to the verifier, here's my split of my element, go get the witness for me. Again, the verifier can't correlate the element. The revocation manager can't correlate the element. 
And the, the, the call home, the revocation manager doesn't know which holder is involved. It just knows the verifier is doing a presentation request. So it learns when a presentation re is request is done by a verifier, but that's about it. And it only knows the verifier by the IP address. So even that's um, of, of potentially marginal, um, marginal value. So again, super interesting way of doing it um, without any sort of call home. Yeah, I mean, essentially, the revocation manager doesn't know who's who's calling him. He just yeah. knows an update is being requested. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't All matter right. if it's through the verifier, the issuer, the holder. Yeah, it could be anyone. Heck, you could have a the Tor network do it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. All right, folks. Um, that's all we've got for today. That was really good. Um, appreciate uh, your time, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, everybody.